stop thinking of yourself as a salesperson. Think of yourself as a revenue person. So if you get this identity into everybody's minds, sales leaders and marketing leaders, like, okay, like you're still doing your sales thing. You're still doing your marketing thing. But above that, you are revenue leaders. Then it's a huge step. Daniel, how are you doing? Awesome. Thank you. Doing great. Hi, Tom. How's your day? It's good. I went on a run and then I had an electricity outage. So I almost couldn't make it. And I almost had to leave the house and, and go somewhere else to make this meeting because like there was no electricity for the past 20 minutes. <laughs> so interesting, as you might say. I'm glad that we got prioritized because then you were going to leave the house to find someone for the recording. So I really appreciate that. <laughs> but anyway, thank you for your time. What I wanted to cover is I th it seems to me like you have a passion for B2B ABM that I want to dig into. And then there's a couple of other little ancillary things that we're going to dig into as well. But before I guess, if anybody wants to learn more, they need to go to clear B2B or Google your name slash LinkedIn search your name. We'll link all this stuff below if they want to check out like more about you, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. But yeah, like let's kick off and understand your like view on ABM right now. My view on ABM right now, okay, it's consolidating, which is good news. And what we mean by consolidation is that initially, like when ABM became a thing, so to say, in 2004, and then it got picked up again and hyped by all the vendors, by all the consultants. So like there were a lot of expectations about ABM. And as things naturally are, it got a bit overhyped way too big expectations. And now people are starting to realize that it's not a magic bullet. It's a great thing. It's a great strategy. It's not a standalone strategy, not a magic bullet. And so we're sobering out and starting to put things in place regarding ABM. So I don't think it's a strategy in and of itself that can be used by a company. It's certainly an important component of a strategy. Got it. Makes sense. If you want, I can go deeper on this. So the reason it's not a standalone strategy is because when you're talking about account-based marketing, what you're strictly speaking of is creating campaigns and sales sequences and complex motions for specific accounts who are ready to engage. But there is a step preceding that, meaning you have to actually prime or warm up the market. Because if you don't do that, you are strictly limited to outbound. So what they say often is that ABM goes really well with inbound. And I totally agree with that. Or if you want to be more trendy, you can say ABM goes really well with demand generation. And so these it has to be viewed in this context. So it's not a standalone thing, but it latches on to other strategies and motions. What would you say is the difference between ABM and demand generation? Okay, well, in demand generation, by definition, you are creating demand where it doesn't exist. So in an ABM setting, you're approaching and targeting and engaging companies who probably aren't ready to buy your product yet. So what you're doing there is actually building a relationship. Now, when the relationship building happens and you know they're engaging with your content, then it's time to turn on the ABM engine and target them with ads, perhaps to outbound. So it's basically the step that comes after demand generation. So with demand gen, you're getting them ready, you're getting them in state, you're educating them. And when they look ready to move on, when they get in market or become in market, then you turn on the ABM engine and then you can target them. Makes total sense. So when you, because I know the first stage of ABM is like you define exactly who the ideal targets are. Maybe you tier them and you get all the contact data. And then there are actions that need to be taken, right? Right. These actions are often split between sales and marketing. And so if that's the case, if ABM sits within the marketing function, but it uses sales as the resource, like, does that mean the sales technically report into marketing for an ABM like piece of work? Okay, like the general setup with many B2B companies now is that they have a so-called revenue department. And within that revenue department, you have sales and marketing. So in that sense, they would be side by side and there's no hierarchy between them, which totally makes sense. Because if you look at the process of taking the buyer from a completely unaware stage 
to engaging them. And then at the end of the day, trying to sell to them and then selling to them and then reselling to them. Like in that process, you have marketing followed by sales. And obviously you have some overlap in between. And if you ask me, like the big question isn't where the overlap is, whether one function is sales or marketing. It's about how to make the two work together. And because there is such an overlap and they're so dependent on each other and there has to be alignment, that's why it makes sense to put them in the same department. Now, they can still be separate teams and they should be separate teams, just like within marketing, you have performance marketing, you have SEO, you have content and you have whatever PR and whatnot. So it makes sense to still have sales and marketing under separate leaders. But if you're talking about a larger organization, like they definitely have to be joined at the top. Do you have any, because sometimes these groups of people maybe don't get on so well, do you have any like advice or insights on how, if you're a seller, you could engage and build better relationships with marketing and vice versa? Yeah. Okay. So you're asking about how sales and marketing can become better friends, right? Exactly. And work together better. The best, and it's funny you ask this because just the other day I was approached by somebody who is in sales and they really get the demand gen and ABM thing, but their marketing department doesn't yet, really. And so they were asking me, it's like, what do I do as an account executive to get everybody on board? And my advice after some thinking was that, well, the first thing you do is you stop thinking of yourself as a salesperson, think of yourself as a revenue person. So if you get this identity into everybody's minds, sales leaders and marketing leaders, like, okay, like you're still doing your sales thing, you're still doing your marketing thing, but above that you are revenue leaders, then it's a huge step. So it's not just that we are one team, but let's understand that we are all in here for revenue. And that doesn't mean that marketing only cares about revenue and all that they do should tie into revenue. It's like, that doesn't, I'm not implying that. It's just that like, let's make it a part of our identities that we're in, we're revenue people before we are sales and marketing people. So then how that actually works in terms of accountability within an organization is the revenue leader, whatever job title we want to give them, they're given a revenue target and they have to use the resources, both sales and marketing, and maybe sales and marketing ops, I suppose, as resources to hit their goal. Would you agree? Yeah. So... What generally happens is, yes, they're given revenue targets. And then at the end of the day, like sales is going to have a bigger chunk of the accountability just because they're closer to the fire. They're closer to the goal. So it's like when it's the football World Cups now. So when a team needs to score, it's primarily on the strikers, like the two or three guys who are attacking in offense, but their job is not enough. So you still need to get the midfield and even the, what do you call them? Linebacks? Yeah, no, no, not that's American football. Defenders. The defense, yeah. <laughs> okay. So you need to get the defenders and especially the midfield to set up the situations. But at the end of the day, if the strikers are going to be the ones who are most accountable for a lack of goals, if it doesn't happen, and they'll be most celebrated if it does happen. That makes sense. So when you like go in and work with clients and they have a CMO and they have a VP of sales and they don't really talk, they both report, let's say, into the CEO. Do you like make this recommendation? There should be a joint revenue team. Yeah. And it's funny how in a lot of organizations, like it's been, they've had a very similar setup for a while, especially if you go into software development companies. So not necessarily product companies, but development companies they often have someone called the commercial director and the marketing would report to them as well as sales. And so it's like a revenue function and it's been that way for God knows how long. So it's not a completely new thing, this concept of a CRO. Sometimes they already have that. If they don't have that, then yes, that's generally the advice as we start working together to get the people together as often as possible and preferably have the leader be super clear on what's happening with who, where, and what are the motions, because that way they can have a handle on things. And it's super hard because sometimes, you know, theoretically people will agree, like what we're talking about here, like that takes five minutes to get across and you'll see like heads nodding. Oh yeah, makes total sense, 100%. And then when it comes to the day-to-day, people just gravitate back to their old ways of doing things. And then like even we're working with a client for 15 or 16 months now. And I just started to realize that for 
we set up this very healthy cadence where we would regularly meet with not just sales, but also with product, with the head of product. And it was awesome. And then I'm just realizing that for the past couple of weeks, the sales and product guys just started to wash off and not take part in these meetings. So because so people gravitate back to their old way of doing things. And if they don't see like the direct consequence and direct benefit of working together as one team, then it's easy to let go. So it takes some real consciousness and management and staying on track. Would you put the SDRs, the sales development reps, in the marketing or sales part of the revenue function? <laughs> That's a good question. And it leads very far because the way, okay, most successful SDRs I see are basically social media managers. <laughs> they act like social media managers. They're like so active and they're creating demand. And what I'm seeing is that there is the way business works nowadays, especially technology, SDRs need to be, or in general, salespeople need to be doing social selling the right way. Because by so you tell a salesperson social selling and they'll think of, okay, sending in mails to people cold. And that's how they view social selling. But the best SDRs and account executives are out there on the social networks, creating content, engaging with people. And as long as they're doing that, it doesn't really matter which state department they sit in. I think like it might even be, okay, it's logical for them to be under marketing, but hey, if a sales leader can support them, and if for whatever reason, it's better that they're in sales, do that, do that. But in my mind, they would gravitate toward marketing. But what they actually do as SDRs is far more important than which department they sit in. That makes sense. The, the best definition I like of sales and marketing is sales is just influencing by one-on-one -on -one communication and marketing is influencing by one-to-many communication. And your description, which I love, of the SDRs as essential social media managers is basically saying a chunk of their role is one-to-many influence, which is therefore marketing. So it is super interesting as to where people would sit yeah. in the business. I think this is a lovely jumping off point though to into your use of social. I'd love to understand like the platforms you're focusing. I think it's LinkedIn and TikTok. Your strategy, like how you create all this content because you're pretty prolific. And then the impacts it's having on like your brand and your business. Yeah. So I'd say it's 95% LinkedIn for our company at the moment. And we're experimenting with TikTok. We really should be turning up the knob on TikTok because I got on there about a year ago and I started experimenting a year ago and I've kept it pretty low key ever since. And I don't visit back to TikTok regularly. But like there was a period where I didn't look at TikTok over the summer because of various things. And I went back and just the sheer amount of B2B content on there just exploded over a few months. So I think it's definitely here to stay unless something weird happens at the top in, in America and TikTok gets banned in the US, but that's the US and you still have Europe and the rest of the world. But yeah, so TikTok should be something that in the technology sector you ought to at least keep an eye on and perhaps experiment with. Right. And second part of your question was what I'm finding useful and what tends to work. Okay, so what tends to work is that social media is never or should be a standalone thing. It can work that way, but it's so much more powerful if you tie it into other marketing initiatives. What I mean by that is any campaign that's going on, be it like a quiz, a webinar, or a course that you're putting out that you want people to sign up for, if you put some social media, both organic and paid behind it, it's going to do so much better. And about how impactful it is for us, it's very impactful because it's almost the, well, it's a primary channel, a primary client acquisition channel. And it is the dark social, as they say, because we'd have a client, you know, we'd have a buyer, they'd come in and they said, hi, found you on, on LinkedIn. I liked your content. Let's talk. And then eight days later, we would sign a contract. And they have never once engaged with anything that I wrote. The guy was just researching. He was totally in market. He looked at a couple of people on LinkedIn and for some reason decided to give me and a couple of others a call. And we had a conversation and bam. So that was 100% LinkedIn, not any other marketing activity or channel. And it's pretty common. It's pretty common. And so who from the business is posting like outside of you if there is anybody else? And then what kind of things are you posting? And then how do you like work that into your like daily work schedule? Yeah. Okay. So 
we have two other people posting from the business on their private profiles. And we have a company page and the company page essentially just repurposes some of my stuff. So currently we're posting once a week on the company page, which is a repurposing of an earlier pro post of mine and other people, you know, I just tell them to post about whatever they want because initially that's going to be the easiest route and it tends to work out the best over the long term. So if you tell people social is such a free and intuitive medium, if you really try to direct people, then it's not going to work out. So of course, you're going to have business objectives. But for the moment, we don't worry about that. We just want people out there posting, building a presence for themselves. And obviously, it's going to be something business related. And because they're in marketing, it's going to be marketing related. So as long as they have that, then it's cool. And if they if we're running a webinar, and they just knock a link out with their content saying, hey, you should sign up for this, then even better, but it's not even important. You had another question. Oh uh, yeah, about how you fit this into your like productivity workflow. Oh yeah, I really suck at creating content for social media. So it should be something that is systematic. And what we do for our clients when we repost on social media, it's like totally systematic, it's totally process-based. And uh, I have relatively little to do with it. It's handled by the others. And for myself, it's just so random and spontaneous. And <laughs> it's the hardest part of my day. I try to post every weekday but it never happens. So I end up posting about three to five times a week. And I just have something random on my mind. And I start typing about it. And sometimes it'll be 20 minutes. Sometimes it'll be an hour. Sometimes it'll just like today, I start typing. And I'd be like, okay, this would make a great webinar topic. And so I stop the post, I go and set up a webinar. And then I finish the post and I link, <laughs> I put the link to the webinar registration page. So it's very spontaneous, which is totally unsustainable in the long run. So I really should be, because this is a confessions show, right? So I'm here confessing my, my shortcomings to you. So in the long run, what really should happen is for me to have a systematic way to brainstorm content and then create content and just make it happen that way so that it's much more predictable and not based on surprises and, and weird things. We appreciate the confession. I do love the <laughs> approach of like writing a post, be like, yeah, this would be a good webinar. Set the webinar up. So you're like prepping, I don't know, even before you, it's like a spontaneous creation of the CTA as you're creating the content itself. Let's, now you mentioned it, this webinar strategy, because I kind of felt like webinars went out of fashion like a few years ago. A, it's like hard to get people there. And then B, like you, it's really hard to make a webinar like really good. And then C, if you like pitch people on the webinar or after the webinar, from what I was seeing before, we weren't getting as great a conversion as you would like five years ago. But I'd love to understand how you're running that process. Great questions. All of them great questions. So number one, yes, it's harder to get people to sign up for a webinar. Number two, yes, it's hard to get those who signed up to show up. And so there are a little tweaks that you can do. One is not to frame it as a webinar. You can frame it as a class, as a training, as a Zoom call to make it feel not like a webinar. Of course, people know that the format is going to be pretty similar. But if you frame their mind differently about it, then it's going to be different. Also, if your topic is niche enough and relevant enough for the target audience, it's going to work better. The thing about pitching is that I am for pitching, actually, and it's worked well for us. So we would provide about 45 minutes of golden content, like very heavy and practical and applicable content. And then quite often we segue into an offer, which would be like an initial project or a sprint with us. And we're pretty frank about this. So like once we hit the 45 to 50 minute mark, I would say, okay, so you see the process. You can go and implement this at your organization. If you've got questions, if you're stuck, message me, I'll help you. If you're interested in doing this with a consultant, let me show you our process and the price for how much we do it for. Or because we quite often have other B2B consultants and agencies, uh, on the call, I would also add that, hey, if you're an agency, feel free to add this to your services if it makes sense. And if, once you've experimented with it, here's our process, use it. Makes total sense. <laughs> here's how we frame it. And so we just go that, okay, so what's going to happen in this sprint is we do this and then 
we get your target audience and then we set up this and then we set up that and then we test this we test that bam 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 and then out it goes and and in the end we'll even say okay like for a limited time if you sign up with us right now we can do this for this much instead of that much and nobody's offended i mean it's like <laughs> because if they stop to the end of a 45 or a 50 minute presentation which they usually do so those who show up will tend to stay towards the end i mean if they're that interested then they're going to be interested in the implementation of what they just heard what doesn't work and what we never even tried or attempted to do is to build a whole webinar around like a feature or a product presentation. So like I would never disguise a pitch as a webinar. So that would really suck. Got it. So the key is like being, ensuring that you're adding value to the people's lives before you go in with the pitch. And it's quite a smooth one, right? Could you like, you go ahead, do it yourself, or we can do it for you. So it's a very smooth pitch. Makes total sense. Exactly. Yeah. And then just one more thing. If you're a service-based company, like even the pitch should provide value as in teaching and process and the components. So even that has value. Makes total sense. If you do it right. What do you uh, mean by a new school lead gen? Yeah, okay, so lead generation gets a really bad rep for a reason. And when people start smashing on lead generation, what they mean is putting out some shitty ebook and then whoever downloads it gets called by an SDR or put into a seven-step email nurturing sequence. And so we're assuming that that's what lead generation is, just because that's what most B2B companies are doing. But there are so many other opportunities to generate legit leads. And what I mean, like some of the stuff I mean isn't even new school. So I just, you know, it's just a sensible and a better and more value-driven way to generate leads. And so some of the things you can be doing for starters, so like a webinar or a training or however you frame it, that can also serve as a lead generation mechanism. Now, what you do with the leads that you would do, whether you want to call them leads or just contacts, it doesn't really matter. What matters is what you do with them. So you shouldn't be contacting people just because they have, they signed up to consume some content of yours, be it a webinar or an ebook or a course or whatever. So you shouldn't pitch them. You shouldn't be assuming that they're ready to buy just because they're consuming some very vague awareness-based demand generation piece of content, okay? So that's one thing, but you're still getting contacts and then you can get back to them later. So when you have a follow-up episode, if you have a tool that they can use, you are advised to reach out to them and provide even more value after you got their email address and their contact data. So what are some of the things you can do? Like I mentioned webinars. The other thing that you can do is set up tools. No-brainer for many Software-based businesses would be a calculator, an ROI calculator that helps them calculate costs. What we love and do for almost every client sooner or later is assessments or quizzes. So something that helps the audience assess where they are and what the next steps should be. So you're already providing value in the form of semi-personalized advice because you're asking them questions and based on the answers, you're giving them recommendations on how to go forward with their situation. And so what the reason we love this is because you're getting zero party data. So they're willingly giving you data about where they are, what they do, what they think about your certain topic, and you get their contact information in the end if they give it to you. It's a really powerful and mutually beneficial way of generating leads. Got it. So I think what we're talking about when we say new school lead generation is like just, yes, it's fine to collect email addresses. But it isn't really fine to pitch people that are definitely not ready to buy because you harm the relationship. And so you can collect email addresses, but then you want to keep on adding value until they come to you or until they really show some intent that they want to buy and then you pitch. Is that right? Exactly. Exactly. We should also talk about the other things that you're doing. And so it's what I'm really passionate about is over delivering. So ungating a lot of super valuable content that most other companies and competitors would gate. So that people, especially if it's like the top of funnel generic or demand gen stuff and not really the later stage and more detailed, more technical stuff. So if you ungate your, the best of your work, it's going to be one form of over delivering. And then when you're actually collecting an email address, then again, you should be over delivering and saying, oh, wow, I would need to pay consultants for this knowledge. You want that impression to sort of arise or emerge when they're consuming your content and using your assets. 
So over delivering. And so when you do collect an email address, like make sure there's a lot of value behind it. Always over delivering. I think that's a good way or maybe a good summary of our conversation. And that's the vibe I'm getting (laughs) is that you like both for your company and also like clear B2B for anybody, Google that with a K. And for your clients, it seems like the focus is add value up front. If we do that in the B2B world, then ultimately people are going to come back to us, whether that's through you posting on LinkedIn and TikTok, through you setting up quizzes for clients, whether that's you through the webinars. Would you say that's a good summary of the Clear and Daniel approach? Yeah. And you know, the other thing that's at play here that's important to keep in mind is the network effect. So a lot of times when you're going out there, putting out useful content and constantly over delivering, you're building something that's bigger than your self or your company. And you're building this pie, like the whole industry that's going to benefit from you. And sooner or later, it's going to like trickle back down to you. So the benefits are going to come back to you in an indirect way. But the thing is to keep in mind is that you're actually building something that is greater than yourself. Love that message. Daniel, I want to thank you so much. We're going to link to the website. We're going to link to your LinkedIn. We're going to link to your TikTok as well below. But is there anywhere else people can find you? Yeah, we've got a show of our own on Spotify. It's called The Electric B2B Show. So wherever you listen to podcasts, Google or Apple or Spotify, you can find The Electric B2B Show. And that's where I hash out content on a more or less weekly basis. That will also be linked below. Daniel of Clear B2B, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Tom. It was great. All right, guys. Thank you so much to Daniel of Clear B2B for coming on and being so generous with the ABM demand gen social knowledge. I love the final vibe that we came up with, which is I think the one thing you should take away from this episode, if you take away anything, which is to simply remember, try to add value up front. If you do that over the long term, that goodwill will compound and will ultimately come back to you in the form of demo requests, leads generated or proposal requests. We must also give a massive shout out to Hrefs Webmaster Tools. If you go there, Google Hrefs Webmaster Tools, sign up for free. You'll get backlink tracking, SEO health tracking, and keyword tracking all completely for free. So go and do that. Now, if you have any feedback for the show, please go to Apple Podcasts, leave a rating and review. Send me the screenshot either to tom at fame.so or in a DM on LinkedIn, and I will get you a shout out on the show. Thank you so much for listening.